This podcast is intended for educational and informational purposes only and does not replace independent professional judgment. Land Gorilla Inc. makes no representations, warranties, or promises for and disclaims any express or implied warranties related to content. Before acting on any information, you should consider the appropriateness of the information as it pertains to your unique business needs. Hello, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Jamie Lee, and this is the Construction Lending Podcast, where we are sharing information, trends, and best practices around all things related to construction financing. Today's topic is the USDA Single Family Housing Guaranteed Loan. According to findings from the National Association of Home Builders Home Building Geography Index, the largest growth in single-family market share came in rural markets, rising from 9.4% in the fourth quarter of 2019 to a share of 11.8% in the fourth quarter of 2022. Joining us today is Ed Peace, Finance and Loan Analyst at the USDA, and Shannon Ferris, Director of Strategic Relations at Land Gorilla. Thank you both for being here. Before we get started with the, our questions, I'm going to turn it over to Shannon to share why mortgage lenders should get excited about the USDA's Single Family Housing Guaranteed Loan. Shannon, over to you. Hey, thank you for uh, having us here today. I just wanted to share with uh, everyone the issue that we commonly see with our lender clients, and that is that they're all looking for new sources of loan production that are purchase-centric loan products. Uh, Construction lending certainly falls into that bucket, And, and we're seeing many, many lenders standing up a construction to perm program for the first time. And for me, it's particularly uh, exciting to see the USDA launching their securitizable construction to perm loan program, because it does provide a solution to uh, lenders uh, regarding issues like profitability, gain on sale, market share, Profit margins, of course, are on everyone's mind. And anytime you're able to originate a loan that can be sold immediately, you know, that that has a very big impact on the loan production and profitability of a company. And in this case, Ed's going to spend some time talking to you and explaining to you the different versions of construction to perm loans at USDA. And I know that he's going to spend some time talking about the Jenny May Securitizable Construction to Perm Program, which allows the lender to sell the loan before the house has been built, which is very unique to be able to book that uh, profitability and that gain on sale of the loan once it's gotten into a mortgage-backed security like a Jenny May And so that, for me, is very exciting. I know it's generating a lot of interest from lenders, and that's one of the reasons that we've asked Ed to join us on this call. Thank you, Shannon, for sharing those insights. I know that I have joined you in a few um, events, and when you have brought up the USDA, it was like everybody just had questions and their ears perked. So let's get right into the topic, um, as there are a lot to cover. Um, Ed, we're so glad you could join us today. Please tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started with the USDA. Yeah, thank you so much, Jamie Lee. Um, g- always glad to be a part of uh, an event like this, like this podcast, and always excited to share information about the, our USDA Rural Development Mortgage Programs. So a little about me, uh, I grew up on a farm in Georgia, and having a degree in ag economics, I was able to start with USDA Rural Development in 1989, all the way back to 89. It was called Farmers wow. Home Administration back then, in a local office in Georgia, and moved around several different offices um, my duties back then were loan origination, underwriting, appraising, inspections for new construction and repairs, loan servicing, and was able to work my way to the state office as guaranteed loan coordinator. So I was kind of the point of contact for all lenders uh, for the program when it came out. Uh, in, well, I was at that point of contact in 91, but I, I became the contact after 1998. And then um, 
and then eventually to single family housing program director for 12 years. Um, wow. As program director, I was overseeing all single family housing operations in Georgia. And now I'm happily uh, able to serve on the national office staff on what we call the lender and partner activities branch. Um, our main activities are training and education and outreach for our programs. And so that's a little about me. You have some great experience, Ed, and you are no stranger to the USDA. Um, before we get into the specifics of the loan program, let's take a step back and address the statistics. Like what is causing the shift with families moving away from the city and into rural markets? I mean, is this a trend that you think that will continue? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, when it first, you know, when I first saw those statistics, it kind of opened my eyes a little bit. And, you know, probably the biggest factor is how the COVID-19 pandemic shifted employers' working models away from the traditional way of, of people having to live in the same town that you work in and how right. telework or remote working has kind of, you know, decoupled where people can live in relation to where they work. So um, out in rural areas, people have more, you know, elbow room, um, less traffic, possibly safer environments for themselves and their families. And, and uh, probably one of the biggest things is more home for less money, that bang for the buck. In, in the rural areas versus the more suburban or urban areas. Um, and especially when faced with, you know, record inflation, like we've been seeing the last few years, uh, people are looking for the ability to form a, afford a home at all. And the uh, lower cost of homes in rural areas has contributed greatly to this shift, I believe. So yeah, all these factors kind of line up to cause this shift in, uh, in, in growth in rural areas. Um, I do believe that um, as long as, you know, employers allow their uh, employees to work remotely, I do think this trend will continue. So, yeah, that's a great point. Right. And I'm sure as you were listing out those reasons why this shift is happening, our listeners ears perked up because I know even for myself, I'm in that state in which, you know, Teleworking, teleworking, like you mentioned, um, plays a big role in being able to have that flexibility to to move where you would like, um, but still be able to keep your employment. But let me ask you, Ed, like what is considered as a rural area? Yeah, great question. So the easy answer is uh, any town with a population of 35,000 or less uh, residents. And that's defined by the census, uh, U.S. census every 10 years. And so it's interesting that we're talking about that because this is one of the years that we're actually reviewing, going through that um, uh, uh, every, that five year review. So so we're required to review our rural urban lines every five years, and immediately after the census information is released, um, which we're working on the 2020 census, and it takes a while for that information to get to us. But that's what we're working on now to see if those urban lines have grown out anymore from the urban centers or if they've shrunk some, uh, typically they grow outward because, you know, f trends over the last decades, except for what we just talked about, you know, those, the urban areas typically tend to expand. And so we're going through that review right now uh, nationwide and, and probably go live with those maps on October the 1st. So with any changes. So, yeah. So, with you mentioned that the urban areas can expand with this shift that we're discussing, can rural areas begin to dwindle down and turn into an urban area? That's a great question also. So the answer is yes, um, it does happen uh, some and quite a bit in some areas. Naturally, developers interest peak, you know, when they learn about our program and that it's available in the urban, I mean, sorry, the rural areas. And so they start to build in those rural areas, especially if they adjoin a faster growing area, you know. Um, mm. uh, so that kind of spillover from the urban urban growth into what is now still rural uh, causes that rural area to grow. And um, if if it grows to the point of not being able to distinguish between the urban area and the, the old rural area, you know, that line is then moved outward um, and and that rural area does shrink a little bit. So, you know, it sounds like a bad thing, but in a way, it's, you know, it's our program is doing what it's designed to do. So uh, it, it can be considered a good thing in, in that we're helping uh, those in those areas, you know, get into home ownership. 
you brought up your loan program that is helpful in creating urban areas and, you know, getting people into homes. Now, tell us, what is the USDA single family housing guaranteed loan? How much time do we have? (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, um, in in, let let me start out by saying at this point, it's very important to differentiate and and state the fact that USDA has two very different and distinct housing programs. The first one is called the Section 502 Direct Program, and it was established in 1949 by Congress uh, under the um, under the um, Housing Act of 1949. And that program is is administered by totally by USDA employees to what we consider low income families and individuals. That's folks that are 80 percent or below of moderate of the uh, area median income. And uh, so the those that program uh, carries subsidy with it where the agency and taxpayers help make those mortgage payments if the people qualify for subsidy. So um, that's very different than than our guaranteed loans that we're mainly here to talk about today. So um, so the guaranteed program, it was uh, brought about in 1991, kind of as an expansion of the Housing Act of 1949. And um, it allows for people of what's considered moderate income versus the low, but moderate income individuals and families to obtain a loan through a bank or mortgage company. And then USDA, as that bank or mortgage company is originating and underwriting that loan, you know, submits it to USDA. And we put a guarantee on that loan to say that if, if that lender ever has to liquidate that loan, heaven forbid, that USDA will um, basically reimburse them for any loss that they suffer on that law on that loan. So, um, so again, it's the bank or mortgage company or credit union, is making these loans and we back it with a 90% guarantee. Wow. So that's 90% of the original loan amount. So yeah, what's not to love about that, right? <laughs> I was just going to say, it sounds a little too good to be true, Ed. Yeah. So all of our USDA mortgage programs, be it whether, whether it's um, the direct program or the guaranteed program, they have no down payment requirements. So it's a hundred percent loan to value up to the appraised value. OK, uh, mm-hmm. and with that federal government backing so we can allow financing of 100 percent of the praise value, like I mentioned. As a matter of fact, we we uh, do require a one percent upfront guarantee fee with every loan that we close. Uh, and that fee can always be financed into the loan. So and, and that's regardless of the appraised value. So actually, it's a 101 percent loan to value loan. And um, so. That fee that's paid by every um, person that gets a guaranteed loan, that's what runs the program. It, it, that money's kind of put into a, a pot of money, and, and any losses that the agency pays in the program comes from that pot of money. So it's it's very favored program on Capitol Hill because um, it doesn't take taxpayers' money to run it. And um, so speaking more about you know, who we're talking about, let's look at the applicants a little bit and and keep in mind that we do have maximum household income limits. Uh, Again, that's 115% of area median income. Um, But that's pretty liberal um, because it includes a lot of families and individuals. Every state has different income limits, but the lowest of the maximum published limits is $103,000 for a household of one to four people. So if you have an individual that's making $100,000 or even $103,000, they could qualify income wise, you know, as far as being under the limits. Um, Households of five or more people, it's 136,000 maximum income for the household. And the fact that we have to abide by income limits, that was established by Congress in that Housing Act of 1949. So um, and again, in 91, we added the guaranteed loans. So as part of the law, it's uh, the other part of that law is that the property has to be in that rural area that we talked about. So that's the that's the two major components. And those are considered statutory requirements. In other words, you know, spelled out by the statute or the law. 
that would have to meet income limits and the property has to be in a rural area. And we talk about rural areas and, you know, the fact that it's 35,000 or less in population, but really and truly, when you look at the maps of the rural areas, the the vast majority of the country is a rural area. It's, it's over 90% of the land mass uh, in, in the United States that falls under USDA's definition of rural. So, we can we can go far and wide uh, on, on our programs. So uh, that's an it, interesting uh, statistic because yeah. I think when we think about urban areas or we think about North America, we we focus on those urban areas where we think, hey, the majority of of America is urban areas, and right. I'm glad that you pointed that out. Yeah, and another statistic, um, I believe, by the census is that four out of five households in the country uh, fall under the 115% of, of median income. So they fall under our income limits. So um, again, that's, so, so those are limitations, but they're not very restrictive, you know? So, so that's what we like to say, but getting back to the applicant, uh, as far as their credit requirements, credit histories go, um, it's pretty generous actually. Uh, USDA, we don't have any particular credit score that they have to meet. So we rely on the lender's credit requirements and their secondary market credit overlays. Um, so, you know, basically they're underwriting by their, by their underwriting standards, not USDA's particularly in as far as the credit goes. And when it comes to repayment ratios, uh, the typical front end and back end of 29 and 41, that's kind of our starting point as far as the maximum ratios go. Um, our GUS system, that's the guaranteed underwriting system. It's an automated underwriting system. It's pretty generous and it looks at strengths and weaknesses and the stability of the applicant situation before rendering an underwriting recommendation. So we can go, you know, a lot of loans that receive a, uh, an accept recommendation are actually above, above the 2941 ratios. So, so it, again, it, it kind of, it, it, it looks at algorithms that try to make it make sense to say, Hey, you know, if you if you're real strong in in all areas, all other areas of underwriting, then we should be able to, you know, allow it a little bit higher ratios there. So, and Gus, the automation of Gus, you know, was able to bring consistency into the program. So, you, you said a lot of um, lenders were very interested in about the single closed construction or the construction of perm loans that we we have to offer. So. We find a lot of interest in that program as well. So um, that's where the loan closing can cover both the construction financing as well as the permanent loan. It's all rolled into one loan closing. And of course, that saves the applicant time and money because they no longer have to secure a temporary construction loan and then later have to refinance the short term financing with a permanent mortgage. It's all rolled into one loan closing. So that saves them on, you know, closing costs. They don't have to close two different loans and, you know, take off work to attend two different loan closings. So very convenient for the applicant themselves. Um, and within that loan feature, the applicants have the option of establishing reserve accounts from loan funds for either the interest only payments that would have been made during construction, or they can opt to establish a PITI payment reserve in order to make the uh, principal interest taxes and insurance payments that are due during construction. And by doing that, the borrower isn't having to make rent payments plus the new house payment while they're building the house. So that, that helps them out a lot there too. Ed, can you comment on the, the difference between the interest only version versus the PITI version uh, one being securitizable immediately, the other being securitizable at completion. Could you draw the distinction between the two of those? Sure can. So, so yeah, the you know what everybody usually thinks of um, is the interest only. That's that's like what's been done conventionally for forever, where only the interest that's accruing on the funds as they're drawn down, as the construction draws are made. Uh, interest accrues on on that advance, uh, that total advance. And so with that, um, any interest that's accruing during the construction period, you know, the applicant has the, or by that time it's a borrower, 
they have the um, option to pay those payments either out of pocket if they have the, you know, the personal funds to do so, or out of this payment reserve to make the interest payments out of uh, from loan funds. And so in that product, um, at the end of construction, the lender would then uh, reamortize the loan and, um, and, and establish a permanent uh, long-term payment uh, and after that reamortization. So, um, so compare that to the securitizable version. So the securitizable version is where the PITI payments are established and start from within 60 days of the loan closing. And so the secondary market would look at that as being, you know, as a closed loan with payments already being made on it with a mortgage on the property. And so um, they, they consider that a fully securitized loan, even though the, the property has not yet been built and payments are being made on that. So it's an income generating uh, product for them. So, so at the end of construction on that type of loan, there's no need to reamortize that loan. So payments just continue to be, you know, continue being made and, um, and, and the, the loan, you know, the construction part is closed out. The inspections, final inspection is, has been made and the borrower just takes over those payments if they're being made out of the reserve account or uh, if they have been making some of those payments themselves, they, they just continue right on to make those payments uh, as a permanent loan. So does that answer the question there? Yes, Shannon? sir, it does. And, you know, another question that we get very often is, uh, whether or not the borrower has to use a licensed general contractor yes. to build a house or whether or not the borrower can be an owner builder um, and build their own home. Right, right. So the answer to that is um, that, that owner builders are not eligible for this type of uh, financing under our guaranteed loan. So they do have to use a third party general contractor. Okay. The licensing aspect is only if that state that the, the property is located in and the contractor is located in uh, requires a license. So does the question. lender have to vet out the, the contractor, the builder? The yes. Okay. Yes, they do. Um, they have to make sure that the lender has at least two, I'm sorry, that the builder has at least two years history in single family housing construction, not just you know a repair contractor trying to get started in building. They have to have two years uh um, experience in completing a, a whole single family, you know, home uh, in, in, in the construction process. Does the contractor have to provide financial statements to be vetted out? I mean, you know, two years of the tax returns, is that part of the, the vetting process required by USDA? USDA does not specify that. Um, and we leave that up to the lenders prudent, um, you know, prudent lending practices. So if that's part of their, um, if that's part of their normal vetting process, then that's what would take place. We don't specify that they have to go through those steps. Those are great questions. And I think these are questions that our listeners want to hear. Um, Ed, you have presented the guaranteed loan so beneficial to the borrowers or the potential homeowners. Now let's dial it back to the mortgage lenders. What benefits will they have you being able to offer these guaranteed loans? Yes. Yeah, so um, they can increase their client base by offering a no down payment program uh, with the lowest out of pocket costs and the lowest monthly costs uh, along with the government backing. So Again, you know, kind of say what's not to love about it. So, right. Do they have a separate approval process um, as a mortgage lender to be able to be able to begin offering the guaranteed loan? Um, yes, if they're going to be if they're going to seek underwriting approval where they're actually underwriting the loan, they they do have a, a separate um, approval process. Um, if they're underwriting or servicing loans, so. But in all cases, the lender's principal officers have to have two years uh, experience in making or servicing guaranteed mortgage loans. And if they're already approved with another recognized source, such as government entities like Fannie, Freddie, Jenny, HUD, or VA, or their state's housing finance, finance agency, 
uh, they can usually be approved with USDA. So the flip side of that is they, um, if they don't have one of these approvals, uh, there's a way to get approved if they can prove demonstrated ability to underwrite sound loans. Mm-hmm. So, but now if, if a lender is approved as a correspondent type lender with, with uh, one of our USDA approved lenders, uh, that, that other lender does not have to seek USDA approval and they can act as a third party originator with them without having to get USDA approval. So, um, and, and to qualify or to uh, say qualify, but to uh, participate in the single close construction loan feature, mm-hmm. uh, USDA approved lenders do not have to seek separate approval for, to, to um, you know, participate in that. So by submitting that type of loan for USDA review and approval, lenders are then certifying that they have at least two years experience in construction lending or that they are employing the services of a third party construction management company, such as Land Gorilla or a similar company. So they can meet that requirement that way. And that's a great point to, uh, that you made. Um, you know, I'm going to shift the questions to specific loan specific uh, questions that we have okay. heard when other um, events when we've brought up USDA. Um, okay. Does the USDA require a fixed price construction contract? Uh, Yes, Um, we can do um, contingencies with that fixed price, but it is still considered a fixed price um, contract. So no, uh, you know, cost plus type contracts. It does need to be a fixed price contract. And then if the loan has to be completed within 12 months, um, do you guys have an extension policy if the home isn't completed on time? Yeah, if the home isn't completed within 12 months. So, yeah, the lender should require to have a contract extension request, you know, completed by the applicant and the contractor to specify the new date of completion. USDA does not dictate the 12 months, except for the fact that we can only include 12 months into the payment reserves from loan funds. So if the time period um, extends past what the borrower has uh, borrowed for payment reserves, then either them or the builder would have to, you know, somebody's going to have to make those payments uh, if if they go beyond what the uh, the loan has allowed for in those payment reserves. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Okay. Now, um, I'm sure you've seen, you know, individuals, homeowners, potential homeowners, they're getting unique with the type of properties they're looking to build. And I think you're catching my drift on this. Um, Are there any property types that are excluded from this program? Yeah, there are. Um, Any property that that has an income producing feature um, and any property that's in the urban area, those are not eligible for this program. Um, so you have to be careful about income producing features. Now, if it's a, if it's a, on a very small scale, uh, basis, like a home craft, um, business or, you know, a haircutting business out of the home, something like that, it just, it's it's just a property that doesn't have commercial features. Uh, and, Mm -hmm. and it's not what, what the regulation says is not principally designed for incoming income producing. So, so we can actually do, you know, Existing site-built homes, we can do new construction site-built homes, as mentioned. All of those are eligible. So are brand-new manufactured homes. And even in some states, we have a pilot going on right now to see if we're going to make this permanent, to see if we can do existing manufactured homes that Mm -hmm. are built after 2006. Yeah, that's kind of new to us. Um, We can allow condominiums, you know, as long as they meet HUD, VA, or Fannie and Freddie requirements, uh, even even special dwelling types like geodesic dome homes and barn dominiums are are eligible and acceptable. As long as again, as long as there's not any type of income producing feature for that, because barn dominiums sometimes, you know, if you look up the definition of that, the you know a lot of times the barn underneath the dwelling could could very well be you know income producing, but if it's just a style barn dominium and not an actual active barn dominium where they're running a, you know, cattle operation or a horse operation out of it, 
uh, could very well be uh, acceptable. So we can even go as far as tiny homes. Uh, we've had some questions oh, nice. about those over the years. Uh, they can also be considered acceptable as long as as long as they're not a manufactured home that's under 400 square feet. We do specify that. Uh, and they meet either the HUD handbook 4000.1 uh, as determined by the appraiser or inspector, and that would be for existing uh, homes, or as long as they meet the building code for brand new construction, um, we can we can accept them. So we do defer to either that HUD handbook 4000.1 for existing homes or for the building code for new construction. And thank you for pointing and specifically mentioning those types of properties, because I know that we've had uh, some questions surrounding barn dominiums and uh, tiny homes. So thank you so much for pointing that out. Yeah. One, one other thing I wanted to mention um, that I might have forgotten uh, in ground swimming pools. I know in the past uh, we have been uh, somewhat restrictive on in ground swimming pools on even existing properties that restriction has been lifted. So we're okay with in-ground swimming pools, hot tubs, and saunas on existing properties. We still want and be able to include them in, in funding on uh, new construction, but we can do them uh, across the board on existing properties. So that was, that was a question we used to have a lot as well. Great. So it seems that, you know, there's some flexibility with the types of property. Are there any limitations to a max? acre limit or a max house size as a percentage of value limit? Uh, no, to both. Um, a lot size just needs to be typical for the area for residential purposes. And the appraiser mm -hmm. is the one to supply that information to the lender who makes the decision. But um, And USDA no longer has a limit of the percentage of value that the lot can have as compared to the total combined cost of the lot and home. We used to have a limitation on that, but that's also been lifted. So there's, so there, there's not a limit on either one of those. Well, this loan program, I, I'm going to run and try and get myself into, to be able to be, <laughs> to get us a guaranteed loan myself here. Um, can, just, can I interrupt you right there and say that in yeah. 1994, my wife and I built a, a, a home in North Georgia through this very program. And, you know, I was the one out there trying to, help get the program off the ground and, and market it to local lenders. And I'd come home at night to our little apartment mm -hmm. and think, well, gosh, you know, I'm describing myself. I had a, a stable job. I had decent credit. I just didn't have money for down payment. And I, I thought, well, what are the, you know, what are the chances of me being able to get a, a loan? Of course I had to jump through special hoops to, you know, make sure I, I didn't make myself a loan, but you know, somebody, somebody else had to, it had to be underwritten, you know, uh, outside of my area. But uh, we were able to to get a loan, and and just a few short years after closing on our brand new house, new construction, uh, we were able to refinance into the uh, private sector and uh, give somebody else wow. a chance. Yeah, you not only talk the talk, but you walk the walk. So you <laughs> yourself and <laughs> USDA, you know, you utilize the loans, and I I believe even Shannon has a similar story where he's uh, helped uh, family members get into USDA loans as well. Correct, Shannon? Yes, that's correct. Quite a number of them, as a matter of fact. And uh, very nice. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, uh, one family member was able to close a purchase on a home in our county. And because the seller uh, agreed to pay the closing costs as a sales concession allowed in the contract per uh, USDA guidelines, they were able to close on that loan and their total out-of-pocket expense was uh, $24 wow. for the cost of the credit report. Yes. Because the seller gave a 3% sales concession and that covered everything else. Wonderful. Yeah. That, so pretty cool story. Yes, it is. Yeah. And hopefully one day when we have an updated podcast regarding USDA, I'll be one of those stories as well. There you go. Uh, that's, the reason, that's the reason why I left the city is I wanted to get, look for a property that was a USDA um, uh, available for USDA. So I'm on yeah. that path myself. Absolutely. So, Ed, we're kind of winding down on the questions, but I know that you had mentioned earlier in the conversation about contingency reserve. Um, yeah. You know, I'm just going to ask it again. 
because I know this is a, a, t- a hot topic and a hot question. Does the USDA require contingency reserve to build to be built into the cost of the loan? No, we do not require it. It is an option, but it is not a requirement. So that's up to the borrower and the lender to make that determination if they want to do that. And um, one of the final questions here, are you seeing lenders having trouble getting the appraisal to come in at value, especially when utilizing payment and contingency reserves? Yeah, it's a good question. No, we're not hearing uh, we're not hearing about this issue. So I think lenders just need to relay to the appraisers all the costs associated with this loan up front. So they kind of know everything that's going into the loan. I think that's the key to it. Okay. Well, um, Shannon, are, do you have any final questions that you would like to ask Ed before uh, we wrap up today? Uh, the only other thing I would say is uh, manufactured housing, factory built housing has been a big piece of our conversations with clients interested in uh, USDA. And uh, I know you mentioned that they are eligible, um, but can you uh, further elaborate just a, a, a moment? You know, do they have to have HUD seals? Can they be MH Advantage homes? Uh, can they be single wide? Do they have to be double wide? Give us a little more color on that. Yes. Yeah, so um, we don't really specify a lot uh, of, of, you know, what the house, the physical characteristics of the house. About the only restriction I know of in the regulation that says that a manufactured home can't be less than 400 square feet. So, again, that's kind of getting into the tiny home um, territory. But, but yes, having the HUD, HUD label. Um, would be a requirement, you know, to say that it meets the federal housing manufactured, federal manufactured housing safety standards. Um, uh, and we don't, we don't require it to be a double wide. It could be a single wide. Um, again, it, that's just, we don't really specify the physical characteristics of those. So one thing I will say is that, you know, over the years we've found, um, found a lot of interest in modular homes as well. Um, and a lot of people don't understand the difference in modular and manufactured homes where modulars are, my understanding is modulars are built in the factory still, but they're built to the building codes as if a site built house was, you know, the same as a site built house is. So different standards there. And that house is then moved from the factory by a, um, you know, on I beams out to, a site built uh, foundation and then lifted by a crane over onto that foundation and strapped down. So by the time it's done, it might have a marriage wall, uh, but by the time it's done, you know, it's, it's very hard to differentiate between a site built home and a modular. So the modular homes don't have the HUD labels. It ha- it will have a um, inspection sticker in it somewhere. Each unit will um, of of from their state housing finance uh, agencies in, in their inspections. So just a little bit about that. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. I've always thought that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ed, thank you so much for joining us today. I know that after listening to this podcast, our listeners are going to have more questions about your program and would like to get started. What is the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, probably the easiest way um, is by email. Um, it's a little bit long, but um, it, it, and it's, an, it's initials that stand for Single Family Housing Guaranteed Loan Division. So that's the, the first letter of each one of those words, S-F-H-G-L-D dot lender partner at USDA dot G-O-V. And we also have a toll free number that's 833 833- Three one four zero one six eight, and there's five options. And if folks listen to those options, I think they can get uh, where they need to go. Thank you both again for joining us. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, and thank you all for listening. If you have any questions or feedback to share, please email us at marketing at landgorilla.com and visit us at landgorilla.com to learn more about solutions to construction loan management. Again, my name is Jamie Lee, and this is the Construction Lending Podcast.